Kindly turn with me to 2 Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter four. Therefore, having this ministry, as we have had mercy shown us, we faint not. Verse 3, but if also our gospel is veiled, it is veiled in those that are lost in whom the God of this world has blinded the thoughts of the unbelieving, so that the radiancy of the glad tidings of the glory of the Christ, who is the image of God, should not shine forth. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus, Lord, and ourselves, your bondmen, for Jesus' sake. The focus is on verse 6 and 7. Because it is the God who spoke that out of darkness light should shine, who has shone in our hearts for the shining forth of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the surpassingness of the power may be of God and not from us. Just a thought on the expression when the apostle said, Who art thou, Lord? And we emphasize the importance of lordship, the importance of headship. But it was impressive that the Lord Jesus brought him back to the expression, I am Jesus. It was necessary for the Apostle Paul to be brought, Saul at that time, to be brought back to that expression. I'm Jesus. Who is Jesus? The despised Nazarene? The one, Saul, whom you've been persecuting. The one despised by the Pharisees and scribes was essential that Saul be brought back to that. Yes, Lord, but I am Jesus. Or oh, that we might be reminded and appreciate his lowliness here in this scene, the lowly Nazarene. I thought of 2 Corinthians 4 as we've been enjoying the challenge as to the greatness and glory of the person with whom we are associated. The one who is presently glorified at the right hand of God after having suffered immensely at the hands of man. God has highly exalted him. And he wants us to have this blessed person as the only object of attraction to our hearts. Amen. He wants every other man to be removed. Saul had to have that. Every other man removed so that only the blessed, glorified, exalted, glorified man might become the prevailing and predominant person in his vision. And I trust that that is so for us today. 
that we see no man save Jesus Christ. We have no other object other than the object that God has set before himself and before us. And hence the challenge. God who has spoken out of darkness. Commanding light in creation to come into expression. Has likewise. Out. Shining from himself. Is the knowledge of the glory of his well beloved son. He has captured our hearts. He has captured our hearts in salvation. He has captured our hearts today as a blessed object. The object of delight. The man of grace who moved here with desire to bring out and bring before man the greatness of his person. As in challenging the lawyer. As in demonstrating that he himself is the only object that God has before man. He has set him before us. He has set none other and will set none other than the greatness and blessedness of his person. He is the one who out of darkness light has shone so that he might shine into our hearts the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. What is the response? The response is that we've got to look in the face of Jesus. Jesus, yes, the lowly Nazarene, is now the glorified one, the one whom God is setting forth as that object of attraction. He's appealing to our hearts. He wants that there be the excellency of the knowledge of the glory of God, which is in the face of Jesus, is now to be our occupation. No greater occupation does God have than occupation with his well-beloved son. And if we are occupied with him, there is the transformation process which will take place. My behavior, my deportment, my response will be commensurate to the knowledge of the glory of God which is in the face of Jesus Christ. My walk will be commensurate with the walk that is suited as a response to him. My talk will be like himself, the one who, when he was here, it says, such gracious words proceeded from his mouth. So the whole person, my entire being, body, soul, and spirit will be so enveloped with the features of Christ so that my behavior will demonstrate consistency with the testimony. So the light of the knowledge of the glory of God that's in the face of Jesus, now he says, we have this treasure. We have a blessed treasure. These earthen vessels of ours, vessels of clay, have now the capacity to contain this wonderful treasure that God has seen fit to find us in suitability to himself to be able to be expressive of that wonderful treasure. 
It's deposited in earthen vessels. Now, a treasure has in view something of value, and I think Brother Steve in the Gospel emphasized that with a coin. A treasure is that which we put and attach tremendous worth to. You ladies don't discard your diamonds in any part of the house when you take them off at the end of the day. There is a special place that you assign them to so that you can have them on the morrow, indicative of the value and the treasure that you place upon those diamonds. Well, God has been pleased to take this wonderful treasure, the excellency of the knowledge of the glory of God, which is in the face of Jesus, and to deposit that in you and me. So we are carrying something of immense value and worth, of immense significance. Hence, we are responsible to hold that treasure in its highest honor. This blessed and glorious knowledge that is in the face of Jesus Christ. How much do I appreciate that? How much do I appreciate what has been deposited in me? How much do I value that God should have looked upon me with sovereign grace and favor and conferred upon me and upon you this dignity associating us with himself by having the knowledge of the glory of himself that is in the face of Jesus be deposited in us. We have this treasure in us. Is it so that I might boast that I have something of value? Yes, we can boast. But is it within my power? Is it there for me to gloat in something that I have that's better than what you have or don't have? No. It is to govern us so that my movements are regulated by the fact that I have that treasure in me. It regulates me. It keeps me humble. It keeps me in a place of submissiveness and dependency rather than exalting myself. This is why we have this treasure in us, that it keeps me down, keeps me low, so that Christ is exalted. Man is abased. Christ is exalted. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the surpassingness of the power may be of God. How wonderful. How wonderful to give God that rightful place by letting that treasure that is in me express not me, but express Christ. Oh, that we might appreciate the greatness of the glory of God that is in the face of Jesus Christ. I'm reminded of when the tabernacle system was established and completed, and Moses brought in all the articles of the, the tabernacle system. Finally, there was no ability for the priest to function because the glory of God had filled the tabernacle system. Similarly, when Solomon completed the temple and every article was in place, what prevailed was the greatness of the glory, the ark of God that represented the greatness and glory and, and, and the person of God. When the ark was brought in and situated, the glory of God hovered over the place. And so the priests were not able to minister because of the filling of the glory of God. 
May it be, beloved, that as having spent time in his presence today, and we've had somewhat of the greatness of the glory of the Lord Jesus brought before us in these examples, that there might be a holy hush, that our lips might be somewhat silenced. How quick we are at times to speak and how slow we are at times to respond. But may it be that having come under the greatness of divine glory today, that there might be that holy hush, the unshod feet that cause us to traffic in the things of God with a holy sense that we are handling divine things. And as handling divine things, there's a great sense of responsibility that's put upon me to walk gingerly, tenderly, recognizing that the power, the surpassing greatness of the power is of God and not of me. May we be encouraged for his name's sake. Amen. Amen.